CSPs have the ACE, they're holding the ACE all the time, which is a network which has been out there forever, and you have an immense amount of power, you've got an immense amount of data that you can use. There's been a lot of talk recently, as we were talking about off-camera before, about um, the fact that uh, some OTT players, whoever, whoever they may be, web scale people, could actually force CSPs out of business and out of the value chain completely. Um, what, how would they do that? Is it even feasible that they could do that? Christos, what do you think? For the, uh, for the uh, over-the-top players, you mean? Mm. Or? Yeah, I think it is feasible, right? And it's probably, yeah. you know, I mean, if you have a lot of cash, right, and it comes back to money again, you know, it's not for everybody, right? But if you look at some of the over-the-top players, if they see that as a way to monetize that and going back to money again, I think they can do it, right? I mean, uh, if you look at Facebook, maybe Apple uh, or Google, for, for for that matter, it's not going to be you know widespread, but certain markets perhaps, and uh, they may want to partner with uh, whomever is the local uh, CSP. If you're looking for Africa, for instance, I think Facebook and, and other com you know other other players are, are very active in that area. So they might form some partnerships and they start deploying some uh, MEC-like type of services. I think it's pretty you know I mean it's very very feasible. I mean. Well, I tend to disagree, because um, first of all, if you, if you look at Facebook, when they mention connectivity, they want to connect people. They're not looking at what we actually mean as a communication service provider when we talk connectivity, the technical term connectivity. For them, it's something different, so that's number one. Um, also, it's actually a difficult business we're in. Investing in access is extremely expensive. And when you look at, at attempts of some of the players in the uh, web scale space to build their own access and run their own fiber, it turned out to be difficult. So uh, still, I don't want the operators to degenerate and just sell access, because I think uh, this is not the best world to be in. I like the operator to be like the one I'm working for, like Deutsche Telekom, to, to serve more than just the access. Because that's a value we are delivering, for example, in the security space uh, to our customers. Christos, you must feel the same, surely, from an operator viewpoint. Well, I mean, as I say, you know, I mean, when it comes, I, I, I don't, I, I don't think like, you know, again, all the players are going to be start building their own infrastructure, right? That that's very uh, costly, but they can do partnerships, you know, at a certain certain markets, and so they can leverage whatever infrastructure is out there. I think a lot of things are going to be around wireless and, and you know, 5G, of course. Um, and I know, I, I, you know, I'm not, we don't even know what this is. is uh, what they're already planning uh, with respect to how they're going to deploy that. Um, I mean, the connected car is another area you can think of uh, something like an MVNO model for mobile edge computing. Uh, you can have like uh, Ford or you know Nissan or Toyota or Mercedes or BMW, mm -hmm. sort of like you know uh, leveraging some of the uh, you know that infrastructure. Um, you know, uh, with 5G network slicing is going to be enabled, so that can be another factor to uh, consider when you're talking about mobile computing. I don't know. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't have like a crystal ball here to see, you know, what certainly what's going to happen. But I th to me, these look, look like all potential, you know, things that, you know, um, the uh, over top players can, can uh, pursue. Sanjay, with your red hat, hat on, yeah. as it were, um, what, what's your take on that? Well, on what you just said, um, it's interesting. The network slicing piece, everybody's talking about this new feature of 5G. Everyone's like, oh, we're going to do network slicing. Great. But what I think what we forget is that while the standards around network slicing are pretty much done, you know, the physical layer, nobody's really gone and figured out all the other layers to get it back to the cloud. So if I go and deploy an application to service that mobile device, I can't, that application has no way to have a slice inside its data center network that corresponds to the same quality of service as the network slice that I'm getting out at the edge. So what's the point of the slice, right? So we need standards 
probably some modifications in a number of open source projects, whether it's OpenStack, whether it's Kubernetes, whether it's you know, a whole bunch of them, in order to get that whole pathway from the data center all the way out to the edge and all the way out to the 5G environment uh, to be fully um, sort of built out from an API perspective. Right, but that's why we're moving data center towards the edge, right? In order to uh, sort of like address this problem. Edge. So even if you move to the edge, you still need the API there. The API yeah, the API not be there, right? But, but it's know. not there. Well, not that today, <laughs> right? And but there no. might be also a multitude of APIs. So well, that's, we that's always to, the case. That, that's but that's where the the issue comes in, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we need to um, we need to drive the open source community mm -hmm. to see this as a problem and something that needs to be solved. And I think that's, that's one of those key values that the operators have is the service assurance or quality of, sure, mm -hmm. of uh, uh, solutions that they can offer and bring to the market. And bringing it all the way out to the edge is, is going to just you know, exacerbate it because you've got so many distributed small data centers, large ones, they're, they're all over. And how do you make sure that the user experience from uh, location A and location B is the same and the enterprise, who could be a global enterprise, is willing to pay across that network. I think yeah, that's yeah. key differentiation that the comm service providers have. The question is how they get paid for it. Well, right? not, how they and, get, how and, they can make and, the money and off. do it efficiently because, I mean, if you look at the OTT providers and how they do it today, I mean, they don't, they don't have APIs to do this. So they flood the network and see, well, what sticks? <laughs> well, now from- the Bandwidth to solve the from, problem? Now, from, from your guys' perspective, that's not, not great, right? Because every time someone starts the application, well, it's going and flooding and seeing how much you will fit. Right, so it's almost better if, I mean, could, could there be some way it could query and figure out intelligently, well, I've got, you know, this much. I mean, you know, I mean, okay, YouTube has a selector, but, you know, how many people go in uh, and, and down res themselves, right? I and mean, people aren't going to do so, that. Right? So, so, sure, <laughs> there are lots of technical so. issues which still need to be addressed. So. We already discussed security. Uh, the orchestration, the automation, yeah. these are all topics uh, I, I think the industry has to address and it's tightly related to that overall discussion on uh, development towards cloud native. Yeah. Uh, orchestration of containerized solution uh, that's missing really still in the industry. And here we need to act indeed fast because otherwise others are, are grabbing the space. And uh, that is the difficulty. Just look at uh, um, the struggle this industry has to agree even on one orchestration strategy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You touched on, actually, before briefly on NFV and the fact that it's taking longer, perhaps, than anticipated for it to reach maturity, as it were. Part of that surely is because of the of the struggle there has been between perceived or real proprietary standards and open source and open, open standards in general. Are we seeing the game being replayed yet again with MEC? Is it just once more around the block? Are we going to see that same old fight? I think it's still the, the same issue we're facing and I think it's related to maybe also a lack of understanding of the open source ecosystem still. Uh, among man, many of the uh, players here in this space. Um, now it's a great opportunity for companies like Red Hat, for example, uh, but uh, the industry overall, I think, uh, still has to do the homework here. Yeah, I, I'll, Alex, you've been yeah, yeah, quiet I mean, for a while. Yeah, I'll say, um, I think in part, the lesson of NFV has sunk in to some extent with people who are working on MEC in terms of the importance of interaction and engagement with open source community and vice versa. Um, I also think that um, MEC can be in that aspect a somewhat simpler problem in the sense that you can take small incremental steps in MEC. Whereas with NFV, you know, if you're going to transform your, um, your network into a virtualized network, you really have to have a lot of those pieces up front, otherwise it won't work. With MEC, you can figure out strategies 
um, where you deploy edge compute and you kind of take incremental steps because of that. And that helps in, in many, many aspects, right? It helps um, with um, just looking at the investment that a CSP has to make and say, hey, how much do I really have, to, how much do I have to invest before I start seeing anything? Um, it also helps with um, the transformation part and you've mentioned it's not the technological transformation, it's the processes and the people transformation um, that um, turns out to be much more difficult than, than the technology. Well, if you have ways of doing it incrementally, you can also ease that part as well. So I think there's a good chance we'll, we'll see the story of MEC evolve somewhat differently. Um, and, I, and I said, in large part, because the lesson of NFV has sunk in and people don't want to repeat it, but also because with MEC there's opportunities to to do it differently that are not necessarily present when you're thinking about NFV. I think they've also thinking. learned a bit, right, from from the from the past that they have to engage more in the community. Well, and yes, but I mean the 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 fundamental problem, though, with engagement with, with open source community is open source community like standards community is completely contribution driven. Yeah. You can go to an open source organization, and in my capacity as chair of Etsy Mac, I'm having some very good conversation with the OpenStack folks, and they're very, very productive <coughs> conversations, right? But at the end of the day, what OpenStack does about the edge is going to very heavily depend on who contributes code. Yeah. What Etsy Mac does is going to very heavily depends on who brings in contributions. That's a dilemma that's I think ultimately solvable when the same companies start addressing both communities and we do have we do still have a situation where um, the telco community's w uh, way of doing business is um, m much m leans much more towards traditional telco st standards the OTT web scale leans much more towards open source. What's different and is encouraging on the partnership side is at least in this part there is a recognition that you really need a partnership on both sides. So to the extent that we have the kinds of industry partnerships like TIP that provide those opportunities that they, they should alleviate, help alleviate some of that problem yeah. as well. Yeah, you're pointing out one uh, important challenge the operator is actually facing. Hiring open source developers is not the easiest thing for us as operators because uh, the operators are just not the most attractive employers for open source developers. <laughs> and likewise, the, having worked for uh, one of the vendors in the industry for 13 years, uh, even the vendors are not the most attractive place for open source developers to join these days. Yeah, that's why Red Hat sure has, has great uh, position in the industry, uh, and so do some of the others. Uh, but this is the challenge we are facing. Yeah? Even, even if we would want to contribute, it's not done overnight, because it's a cultural change we need to go through to actually yeah. be attractive again for the, it's, those it's developers. It's an organizational change. And, and I think at Red Hat, we realize that um, you know, our CEO continually talks about, you even wrote a book about it organizational change, right? That, I mean, it's not the top-down command and control anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's more flat. And that's how organizations are going to operate in the future. 